fighter jets being shot out of the sky or swallowed whole by unidentified flying objects, photographs that mysteriously disappear. What is this? Space Invaders, the reality show? Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. Post-World War II America was something akin to being in the eye of a hurricane. The decades leading up to that particular war certainly weren't easy. The 1910s saw a pandemic that infected an entire third of the world's population. As if that wasn't bad enough, that pandemic happened in conjunction with the war to end all wars. Of course, when we all realized that that war wasn't going to end anything, we switched to calling it World War I. There was a time of indulgence following that war, but it was brief. The stock market crashed, leading to the Great Depression, and we barely had time to brush the dust bowl off our boots when we entered World War II. By the 1960s, the U.S. was locked in its own internal struggle with civil rights, assassinations, women's rights, free love, communes, the Manson family, and, of course, the Vietnam War. The eye of the hurricane had passed. I realize we also had a two-year conflict in Korea, but in contrast to the peace that followed World War I, Korea was a moment of discord in an otherwise peaceful era. That time, during which we were all safely ensconced within the eye, began somewhere around 1947 and ended as the 1960s came into full bloom. The soldiers had returned home from World War II and took up their lives. The nations worked on reconstructing Europe and exploring the boundaries of radiation poisoning and nuclear power. Children walked or rode their bikes to school without parental supervision. Television was born and took up the central place of honor in our living rooms. Howdy Doody traded wisecracks with Buffalo Bob, and Superman saved the world every weekday afternoon at four. Little boys played baseball at the local park, then ran off to the drugstore to pick up the latest edition of their favorite comic books. Batman, Superman, Western comics, combat comics, horror comics, and science fiction comics filled their minds with all sorts of possibilities. That is, until 1954, when Frederick Wortham released his book, Seduction of the Innocent, a volume of calculated misinformation that landed William Gaines of EC Comics on the witness stand in defense of his industry and, in particular, a certain headless woman on the cover of Crime Suspense Stories No. 22, drawn by Johnny Craig. Everyone owned a car by then. Teenagers gathered at drive-in restaurants for a burger and a malt before heading to drive-in theaters to watch whatever radioactive insect of gigantic proportions hover over whatever simpering Hollywood actress seconds before whatever testosterone-filled Hollywood actor swooped down and saved the day. If not an insect, a prehistoric monster. If not that, aliens from Mars. Aliens, UFOs, and invaders from Mars seemed to be on everyone's mind then. Was it PTSD from World War II? Was it some kind of subconscious reaction to the Russian threat? Or was this a new monster invented to replace the war, the depression, and the pandemic in our minds? From the moment aviator Kenneth Arnold reported seeing what he described as a flying saucer, while en route to an air show in Pendleton, Oregon in June of 1947, we were hooked. <laughs> well, the people of the United States were anyway. Around that time, Mac Brazel was staring at some pretty strange wreckage on his ranch in Lincoln County, New Mexico. Having recently heard the term flying saucer and unable to identify what he was looking at, he put two and two together and contacted the military. Major Jesse Marcel responded to the call, and the Roswell incident was born. Headlines featuring these events and others were popping up in newspapers all over the country. Most of the sightings came from the Southwest, but in January of 1948, there was one case that happened in Kentucky. Thomas Mantell was a 25-year-old Air National Guard pilot with 2,867 hours of flight experience under his belt. On January 7, 1948, the F-51D Mustang he was piloting 
plummeted from the sky and slammed into a Franklin, Kentucky field with enough force to send mangled debris thousands of feet in every direction. Captain Mantell was dead. Was he shot down by an alien spacecraft? To answer that question, we have to look at all the events of that day. It began with a call from Fort Knox to nearby Goodman Air Force Base. Sergeant Quentin Blackwell, the chief operator at Goodman Control Tower, had just seen the object in question himself. It looked like an ice cream cone with a red top, he said later. This led to a call from the tower to Captain Gary Carter, the operations officer. Certainly he needed to put eyes on it before he was willing to do anything about it, and Blackwell and the rest of the tower crew were happy to oblige. Satisfied that the men in charge of traffic control on the airfield that day weren't snacking on magic mushroom hors d'oeuvres and washing them down with happy gas cocktails, he made a quick call to Colonel Guy Hicks, the commanding officer. That couldn't have been an easy call to make. I imagine there was probably at least one threat of being busted back to private. Meanwhile, a squadron of four F-51D Mustangs was heading from Marietta Air Force Base to Standiford Air Force Base. As they approached Goodman around 1420 hours, the tower requested that they investigate the object. One of the planes was low on fuel and had to continue to Standiford, but the other three, led by Captain Mantell, commenced a search. They began their climb. At 14,000 feet, Captain Mantell radioed back to the tower. The object is directly ahead of me and above me now and traveling at about half my speed. At altitudes above 14,000 feet, non-pressurized planes require the use of oxygen masks to supplement the thin air. Without them, a pilot can become confused or, worse, black out. Because their oxygen supplies were running low, the other two pilots peeled off at that point. Captain Mantell continued to 22,000 feet. No one will ever know why he made that decision. Maybe he thought he had enough oxygen, and maybe he did. One of the four pilots was low on fuel. The other three had plenty. It's possible that one of the three remaining planes had enough oxygen while the other two didn't. At 15.15 hours, members of the tower crew reported hearing Mantell say over the radio, It appears to be a metallic object or possible reflections of the sun from a metallic object, and it is of tremendous size. I'm still climbing. The object is above and ahead of me, moving at my speed or faster. I'm trying to close for a better look. Not everyone heard it, but those who did agreed that those were his words, a metallic object of tremendous size. There were other transmissions, but they were too garbled to understand, and then all contact was lost. By 1550 hours, the UFO had disappeared as well, and at 1700 hours, the twisted and shattered wreckage of Captain Thomas Mantell's F-51D Mustang was found scattered across a field in Franklin, Kentucky. The Air Force investigated the crash. With the help of several assumptions and quite a bit of conjecture, they determined that Mantell had climbed to 22,000 feet with minimal oxygen supplies, then continued to 25,000 feet where he would have blacked out. Possibly his plane continued to climb to 30,000 feet, which is its limit, and then went into a nosedive. Falling to earth from that height and that speed, there would have been no hope. There was a suggestion that he may have regained his senses and tried to pull out, but the plane was beginning to disintegrate before it ever hit the ground. If he did wake up, he was most likely aware of his fate. The Air Force first suggested that he had mistaken Venus for a UFO. It wouldn't be the first time or the last that Venus in the evening sky 
has been reported as an unidentified flying object. However, no one ever accused that pretty little diamond in the sky as being of tremendous size. Later, the Air Force changed their opinion to a misidentified weather balloon. Once again, the size of the weather balloon compared to Mantell's description doesn't add up. Then, a famous astrophysicist suggested that he was a victim of sun dogs. They can certainly appear to be a reflection of sunlight off a metallic object. A sun dog or parhelion happens when the sun reflects through ice crystals and appears roughly 22 degrees to the left, right, or on both sides of the sun, depending on the location of the crystals. Really bright sun dogs look kind of cool, almost like a second or third sun in the sky. Crack in the theory appears in the fact that the craft was seen by several different people, viewing it from several different directions. Sun dogs are dependent on the location of the ice crystals and their proximity to the sun. In plain English, if you ain't looking right at the sun, you ain't going to see sun dogs. The general public had its own ideas. Rumors of Russian missiles competed with stories of alien spacecraft using never-before-seen technology to blow our fighter jets out of the sky. The UFO panic was beginning to build. Years later, declassified documents concerning Project Skyhook seemed to answer everything. At the time, the U.S. Navy was conducting top-secret experiments with extremely high-altitude weather balloons for measuring cosmic rays. In a case of the right hand not letting the left hand know what it was doing, they didn't bother to inform the Air Force. When this information came out, most people heaved a sigh of relief and said, Oh yeah, well that makes sense. But it doesn't. An F-51D Mustang is only capable of reaching an altitude of 30,000 feet. The Skyhook weather balloons operated at an altitude of 60,000 feet. At 14,000 feet, Captain Mantell reported it as being directly in front of him and above him and moving at about half his speed. If it had been a Skyhook weather balloon, he would have never gotten that close. Mantell's story is heartbreaking, but it isn't unique. On a cold and rainy November night in 1953, a fighter jet completely disappeared while chasing an unknown object. It was the kind of night when no one wanted to be on duty. A storm had raged over Lake Superior for most of the day. It was fairly stable now, but this was November 23rd on the U.S.-Canadian border. Winter wouldn't officially start for another month, but tell that to the people up north. The men working radar at U.S. Air Defense Command in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, were sipping coffee and dreaming of the turkey and dressing that they would be served all over the country in three days' time. The night was relatively quiet. The green arm of the radar screen swept in concentric circles around a black, empty space. Nothing was out there. Blip! A dot appeared out of nowhere on the screen. The radar operator jumped out of his daze and lurched forward to stare at the dial. Blip! There it was again. A third sweep of the arm and the operator recognized that it was moving at a high rate of speed and heading for restricted space. He calculated the speed at 500 miles per hour, then he picked up the phone and made his report. 27-year-old Felix Jean Moncla Jr. was the athletic type. He'd attended college on a football scholarship before enlisting in the Army to serve for a year as part of the occupation force of Japan. After that, he went back to college for another four years and another degree. When the Korean conflict started in 1950, he re-enlisted, but this time he chose the Air Force. When he climbed into his F-89C Scorpion jet interceptor that night, he'd already clocked 811 flying hours. Mokla had 2nd Lieutenant Robert Wilson with him, observing radar. He was from Oklahoma and serving his first year in the Air Force. The inclement weather wasn't bad enough to keep the two men on the ground, and soon they were in fast pursuit of the unknown object. The craft changed course so often that Wilson struggled to track it on the radar screen. They resorted to relying on the radar operator on the ground to direct them. 
Moncla pushed the jet to 500 miles per hour as the ground operator guided him from 25,000 feet down to 7,000 feet. Slowly, they began to close in on the object. Back at the base, the radar operator watched as the two green dots on the screen converged on each other. Monka climbed again to 8,000 feet. They were 70 miles off Keweenaw Point in the upper peninsula of Michigan, 160 miles northwest of the Sioux Locks, the reason for the forbidden airspace. Then, like two spots of ink on a black canvas, they joined. From that point forward, the F-89 ceased to exist on the radar screen. Seconds later, the first radar return, the one indicating the unidentified flying object, faded into the black as well. The Canadian Air Force joined the U.S. Air Force and Coast Guard in an extensive search for the jet. They held out little hope of finding its occupants alive. Even if they survived an 8,000-foot fall into Lake Superior, it was November. The icy water would have seized the men and quickly pulled them to their deaths. Neither wreckage from the F-89 nor Moncla or Wilson were ever found. The Air Force began honestly. They released a statement to the press briefly indicating that the jet had chased a blip on the radar until it merged with an unknown object. That didn't last for long. In short order, the statement was retracted and replaced by another. In the second version of events... The F-89 completed its intercept with what turned out to be a Canada-Dakota jet that happened to be 30 miles off course. On the return trip to base, Moncla was clearly stricken with vertigo and crashed his plane into the lake. This theory was not received well by Canada. Their Air Force insisted that they had no jets in the air that night anywhere near that area. Meanwhile, Two separate Air Force representatives provided two opposing stories to Monclo's widow. The first told her that her husband had crashed the jet into the water while flying too low, and the second stated that the jet exploded at high altitude. According to Donald Keyhole, who has written extensively on the topic of what has come to be known as the Kinross Incident, the file from the Blue Book Project agreed with the Air Force's assertion that Monclo completed his mission and crashed his plane while suffering from vertigo. The report also stated that the particular behavior on the radar screen was nothing more than atmospheric interference caused by bad weather. When the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NICAP, looked into the case, they discovered that the entire incident had been wiped from the records conveniently allowing the Aerospace Technical Center the opportunity to say there is no record in the Air Force files of sighting at Ken Ross AFB on 23rd of November 1953. There is no case in the files which even closely parallels these circumstances. This in turn allowed civilian groups to develop their own theories. Did an alien spacecraft scoop the plane out of the air and capture the pilot and his navigator so they could teach them how to speak English? As crazy as it sounds, it is only one of dozens of hypotheses that were floated around. No one has ever successfully answered the question of the disappearance of Felix Moncla and Robert Wilson or their F-89 jet. In 2006, a man named Adam Jimenez came forward claiming to represent the Great Lakes Dive Company. He stated that they had found both plane wreckage and pieces of what they believed to be alien spacecraft. However, UFOlogists everywhere found all sorts of holes in his story, not the least of which being the fact that the Great Lakes Dive Company didn't exist. In the end, Jimenez also vanished and has not been heard from again. According to the FAA, vertigo and spatial disorientation account for 15% of aviation accidents, especially during inclement weather and at night. So they may have a point there. And radar is affected by the weather. After all, how would we see those giant storms coming at us from across the country if radar didn't pick up on them, right? In that year, a couple of hikers were out doing their thing in Calvin, Scotland, when they looked up and saw a huge diamond-shaped flying object. Now, if that had been me, I probably would have stood there and stared at it until it either sent a light beam down to pick me up, at which point I'd have had no choice but to join them on board the ship, and with or without me, it flew away. Or, I'd have turned and run like a scared rabbit, 
At which point they probably would have sent a light beam down to pick me up just so they could point and laugh at my inability to escape them. These two hikers, however, were smart. They had a camera and they got six of the clearest photographs of a UFO ever taken. These photographs were not made public. The hikers took them to Scotland's Daily Record newspaper, who handed them over to the British Ministry of Defense, who, um, lost them. Mm -hmm. The negatives were never seen again. The British Ministry of Defense claims they returned the negatives to the Daily Record, and the Daily Record claims they never received them. See, when the Daily Record sent the photographs to the British Ministry of Defense, the British Ministry of Defense was all, hey, you know, uh, we need to look at the negatives for those photographs, too. And someone at the Daily Record said, oh, yeah, sure, sounds legit. Let me throw those in an envelope and mail them off for you. And that was that. For 30 years, the mystery of the disappearance of the amazingly clear photographs of a UFO has been a hot topic in the UFO community. The people who talk about UFOs, not the UFOs themselves. I'm sure aliens all have entire family albums of themselves. These six photographs probably didn't mean anything to them. Most people assumed it was a government cover-up. As the people at the Daily Record would say, sounds legit. After all, the government seems to be pretty handy at covering things up. Actually, come to think of it, they're really not. I mean, look at poor Jesse Marcel. He went on record stating that the debris scattered across the New Mexico desert outside of Roswell was not of this world, only to have to retract his statement and say, On second thought, guys, this looks like a weather balloon to me. I mean, I've dealt with weather balloons for years, so I should know what a weather balloon looks like. So, yeah, definitely a weather balloon with some really weird writing on it. And then there are the multiple press releases during the Ken Ross incident wherein the Air Force started out with what appears to have been the truth, which devolved into a finger-pointing contest with Canada. So maybe governments aren't that adept at covering these things up. They do seem pretty good at losing things, though. I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the U.S. government has lost faith with about half of its citizens, and the other half are probably only hanging on by a thread. And let's not forget how the Library of Congress managed to lose 10 of Walt Whitman's notebooks, six of which have never been found. To be fair, these are all instances of the U.S. government not getting it right. Perhaps the British Ministry of Defense was just better at it than we are. There's also the possibility that they were doing the U.S. a favor by, quote, misplacing, unquote, those photo negatives. Some have claimed that the UFO featured in them was actually a top-secret spaceship that was being worked on by the U.S. at the time, and they, the U.S. government, didn't want those photographs revealed. There have been a lot of other theories about how and why the photographs and their negatives disappeared. Some have been reasonable, and others have been, well, just a tad bit crazy. What made these photographs so special in the first place was their amazing clarity. How many times over the years have we all looked at a photograph or even a video of an unidentified flying object only to discover that it's so grainy or out of focus that it doesn't show us anything? Bigfoot enthusiasts can identify with that. There's nothing like a blob squatch photo to make the whole community look cuckoo. But these particular photographs were different. This one not only shows a clear image of a large diamond-shaped object, there's an airplane in the image with it that is just as, if you'll pardon the expression, identifiable. Clearly, no pun intended, they represent a huge breakthrough in the UFO community. It's no wonder all six photographs mysteriously vanished. If they hadn't, someone was going to have some explaining to do. For 30 years, the story of these photographs grew to mythic proportions with UFO enthusiasts everywhere demanding to know what happened to them. For the past 13 years, British academic and journalist Dr. David Clark has led the charge. His dedication to the subject combined with his skills as an investigative journalist drove him to search records and interview individuals until he finally located one. And would you like to guess where he found it? No? Well, I'll tell you anyway. It was framed and hanging on the wall of the office of former Royal Air Force press officer Craig Lindsay. Seems he'd been hanging on to it for years, hoping someone would just come along and ask him about it. Sounds legit. 
When my friend Kelly first told me about this story, I had a different idea for where I was going with it. But then I took a vacation to Colorado, and then I got sick and missed out on my big first anniversary show on YouTube. Yeah, it was a year ago, December 8th, that I put out my first video, and I wanted to do a big special show and give away a copy of my book or something like that. But, well, as they say, life got in the way. Then my husband told me that Franklin, Kentucky, which isn't that far north of where we live, is making January 7th Captain Thomas Mantell Day in honor of the 75th anniversary of his death. Brad had never heard of the UFO story, and I knew very little about it. But both Cam and Brad like UFO stories, and if it weren't for these two amazing men, I wouldn't be here telling you this story right now. So it seemed like the perfect thing to do, even if I am a month late. Anyone who knows me knows that's only fitting anyway. So I get to celebrate a year on YouTube with my favorite husband and my favorite boss, talking about something that we all three have an interest in. By the way, Brad and I plan to attend the dedication ceremony at the meeting of the Franklin County Historical Society on January 17th. I don't know why they're doing it then and not on the actual day, but we plan to be there for it. As I was working through these three stories and I read about Captain Mantell, Lieutenant Moncla, 2nd Lieutenant Wilson, and the mysterious photograph, I was reminded that NASA announced earlier this year that they're putting together a team to research and try to understand the UFO phenomenon. We've come a long way from the denials and cover-ups of the 20th century. Then it occurred to me, our governments have been searching for life in space for decades. We've sent probes to Mars and developed telescopes to see beyond the stars Meanwhile, more and more documents are being declassified, and more and more information is being learned. Why? Do our governments finally believe we can handle the truth? Or has something happened in space that will prevent them from keeping their secrets much longer? Have they wised up? Do they believe we've wised up? What are they preparing us for? I'm Neoma Finn. 